Good morning. Hello. It's Saturday morning. It's about eight o'clock and it's June 19th. Good morning. We're in the book of Joshua and we're in the chapter 11. How are you today? We have an appointment at nine, so we're getting on here a little early for me. Hello, Melissa. Sunshine. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you've been able to catch up with us now that we're in chapter 11. Yesterday we finished chapter 10, the second half. That was really good. Um, yeah, just the conquering of the land, just one by one by one, the Lord is conquering and fighting for the Israelites, giving them their promised land. All right, so we're in chapter 11 today, and this title here on page 34 is called Joshua's Northern Conquest. And we'll read it, and then um, we will talk about it. Okay, so let's start together here. If you have the Passion Translation, that's the translation we're using. When the news of Israel's southern victories reached King Jabin of Hazor, he organized a massive coalition to fight against Israel, and he sent messages to and then the following kings. So King um, Jabin, um, I just wanted to get to my notes here. Um, first of all, the word Jabin means wisdom, and so he was used, he was a man of wisdom, and he lived or resided or presided over Hazar, which means fortified or a castle, and it was a major city-state that laid about nine miles north of Lake Galilee. And when he had heard of Israel's southern victories, he decided that he would organize a major coalition to fight against Israel. And this would be for the northern part, um, which included, the coalition included King Joab of Merom, the king of Shimron, the king of Ashaf, the kings of the northern hill country, the kings of the Jordan Valley south of Lake Galilee, kings of the foothills, the western kings in the heights of Dor, the eastern and western Canaanite kings, that's a lot of people, the Amorite kings, the Hittite kings, the Perizzite kings, the Jebusite kings in the highlands, and the Hivite kings who lived near Mount Hermon in the land of Mizpah. It's a huge coalition that he formed against Israel. And they came out in full force, it says, with a multitude of horses and chariots. All of these fighting men came in, out against Israel, all of their horses, all of their chariots. Their vast armies were as numerous as the grains of sand in the seashore. Could you imagine just a, a sea of people sea of fighting men. I, I wrote in my margin there, when all hell breaks loose, it feels like you can't even see for the myriad of opposition that's coming. All these kings and their enormous armies joined forces and encamped at Lake Merom to fight against Israel. So there they were, camping at a lake, getting ready to come against Israel and Yahweh again, so faithful, speaks to Joshua, so grateful. And he said, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. Okay, so imagine there's a sea of people, of, of, uh, of an army coming at you. And God says, don't be afraid. By this time tomorrow, Yahweh will have them all lying slain before Israel by this time tomorrow. So he's saying in one day, the sea of people will be slain before you. After the battle, 
he says, to cripple their horses and burn their chariots. Um, this is a hard thing to hear about the horses, but God did not want Israel to trust in horses or chariots. He wanted them to trust only in the Lord. And that's in Psalm 20, verse 7. Burn their chariots. So where we could maybe see that they could use those chariots for their own army. God was saying, no, get rid of them all. Everything that they depended on, everything that they came against you with, you've got to tell it to go. Joshua launched his surprised attack, his surprise attack, and all of his army pounced on them at their camp at Lake Merim. And this next verse says, Yahweh fought alongside of Joshua. God never left Joshua's side. He never stopped engaging in the battle. And I just, again, I just want to think about this in our life too, how we can feel, or I feel sometimes alone, which is not the truth, but God himself is fighting our battles alongside of us. Joshua fought, I'm sorry, Yahweh fought alongside Joshua's fighting men to defeat them. And part of the Israelite army attacked and pursued the retreating forces as far north as the cities of Misrephoth, Ma'am, and Sidon. Another part of the Israelite army pursued the enemy as far east as the Valley of Mizpah. In every direction, crushed and crushing them all, leaving no survivors. Afterwards, Joshua obeyed the Lord and he crippled all of their horses, which is so sad, and burned their chariots because Yahweh had commanded them to do it. If you ever find something difficult to do that the Lord has asked you to do, that's some of the things that I think about that. He was asking for total obedience here. And what is it today that God's asking us to do that seems so contrary to our nature or what we would ever want to do? Um, he is all-knowing. He knows what he's doing. Because Hazor at that time was the most powerful of all these kingdoms, Joshua circled back after the battle and conquered it. They killed the king. They burned Hazor to the ground. How many times have we read this in this, just these first 11 chapters? Burning cities to the ground, taking things um, by force, killing, annihilating, just the gruesomeness of this whole book so far of how they were going in to take their land. They killed the king, they burned Hazar to the ground, and then annihilated all of its inhabitants. No survivors. They spared not one breathing thing, leaving no survivors. They spared not one living thing, leaving no survivors. Joshua conquered all these royal cities and their kings and he destroyed them all as Yahweh's servant Moses had commanded. However, of all the cities built on mounds, Joshua burned down only Hazor. The Israelites kept all the spoils of these towns, including the livestock, but the inhabitants they killed with the sword. There were no survivors. Just keep reading that over and over again, no survivors. I think we have to keep translating that to our enemy. Keep, when you think of no survivors, it's not anyone that is innocent. It is, just think of it full blown as the enemy. Um, and the enemy of our soul, the things that come against us that want to keep us from God's powerful plan for our life is what we're considering to level and to have us no, no survivors. Um, he 
just as Yahweh commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua obeyed everything that Yahweh commanded Moses. So Joshua continued to be obedient, continued to uh, not look at things through his own eyes or the situation through his own emotions, and just obeyed God. Our calling, it says in the notes in verse 15, is not just to be successful, it's to be obedient. So let's go on to the territory taken by Joshua. We're in verse 16 now, on page 36. So Joshua conquered the entire region, the Judean hills, the southern desert, all the land of Goshen, foothills, the lowlands of the Jordan Valley, the northern hill country of Israel, including its lowlands, everything from Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, all the way to Belgad in the Lebanon Valley below Mount Her Hermon. Joshua captured all their kings and executed them. So just think about the far sweeping layers of um, enemy tactics that we have in our lives that go deep into our soul layer upon layer and think about how that some of that is the desert some is the foothills some is the lowlands some is the northern hill country uh, some are the judean hills it's just different areas that the lord is saying take 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 back and joshua captured all of their kings and he executed them Joshua waged war with all of those kings over a long period, and apart from the Hivites living in Gibeon, not one city made peace with Israel. So there was one, which was the Hivites, but none of the others made peace with Israel. By the power of God, by the power of Yahweh, Joshua conquered them all. Yahweh himself, he was the one, God himself hardened the hearts and made them obstinate so that they would attack Israel. Yahweh had determined to wipe them out and condemn them to destruction without mercy, just as he had commanded Moses. Joshua also drove out the Anakim, a race of giants from the hill country, including the cities of Hebron. Eber and Anab from the entire hill country of Judah and Israel. Joshua destroyed the Anakim and their towns so that there were no surviving Anakim in Israelite territory. Um, Anakim, it says in the notes, were the descendants of Anak, and they are mentioned in Numbers 13. They were intimidating giants that kept the Israelites fearful and unbelief. I, that so struck me. I'm so on high alert right now with the Lord regarding unbelief in my own life. Um, these giants keep us or the Israelites fearful in unbelief and that led to the wandering oh, in the wilderness. When I read that, I thought, Lord, what wilderness am I in through unbelief? Where, and I know there are places of wilderness in my life and um, literal wilderness. And I just keep saying, God, the wilderness of unbelief that came through uh, fear, just every way that this is webbed together, I want out of the wilderness. I, I hope that you do too. Here we read that Joshua eliminated these giants, enabling the tribe of Israel to possess their inheritance. So he eliminated them so that they could possess their inheritance. And um, Jesus does this today for us, keeping us, or eliminating the giants that are keeping us from full faith. I sometimes, um, well, again, I'm journeying in faith as well with you as I'm trying to stay in faith and not go in and out, in and out, which has been my tendency. I don't mean like 
losing my faith in God. I just mean faith over a certain thing that I'm believing for, in and out, in and out, or back and forth, wavering. Giants are nothing compared to God's omnipotence. That's what the word says, or the commentary says here. So, Back to verse 22, there were no surviving Anakim, remember these are the giants, in Israelite territory. Some survived, but only in the Philistine cities of Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Gath or Gath is where um, actually um, Goliath that fought David, that's where he was from. That's in 1 Samuel 17, 23. Gaza, the Gaza Strip that we hear about in Israel. Gaza means fortified or strength. And Gath means wine press. And Ashdod means stronghold. These three cities were Philistine cities. And again, I was just telling you, Goliath was from Gath. Um, Verse 23, Joshua conquered the whole land just as Yahweh had promised Moses. Joshua assigned portions of the land to each of the tribes of Israel, and the Israelites lived in peace throughout the land. This is the fulfillment of the promise that God had given to Moses. It's coming into fruition here in the end of chapter 11. We're seeing in the word it says, that the Israelites lived in peace throughout the land. It says in the notes that the land had rest from war. And I was thinking this morning about the verse in Matthew 11, verse 12, that says, the kingdom of heaven is entered into by force. The kingdom of heaven is entered into by force and violent ones take hold of it. The violent ones take hold of it. The, ki the kingdom of heaven is entered into by force and violent ones take hold of it. It seems like we've seen, for lack of a better word, a lot of violence in these first 11 chapters. But now we are coming into a place where we are seeing the peace that God provided for Israel after all of these um, battles and how God fought alongside of them and kept promising them that he would give them the land, the territory that he had promised and that he, he did give it to them, but they had to be obedient down to the last person, goat, <laughs> um, silver necklace. They had to be a woman and child. Those are the things that are hard for me to wrap my head around, but they had to be prepared to um, obey him. It was really a matter of destiny. It was a matter of life and death for them. It was a matter of, are we going to finally come into our inheritance from the Lord? Or would we take a chance and do things our way and skip maybe some parts of what he said for us to do? Now, they had to be totally obedient. And um, I'm just going to pause here for a moment. I know a couple of people have said that they're here this morning. Um, I want to ask, as we come through this kind of big portion of scripture and what we've been learning together and thinking about, is there any thoughts that you have, you want to put in the comments? Um, anything you're grappling with? Um, yeah, how this might be helping you or changing, shaping your thoughts about entering into your promised land. Maybe this is just the way that you live and it's just a confirmation. Is anything you want to say?
Okay. Well, there's a bunch of, well, there's just so many, there's a lot more chapters here in Joshua. We're going to see a confirmation. That's good. We're going to see um, how, yeah. Just keep thinking about how the land means the things that you have in God that he put you on the earth to do and to be that is your land so to speak okay well that's all for today and I hope that I see you um, Monday I guess today is Saturday so we won't see each other tomorrow that will be in chapter 12 on Monday And blessings to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Make sure you go back and get caught up if you need to. All right. God bless you. Bye-bye.